In this chapter, we uh, have to look at a lot of results on sequences and infinite series. So infinite sequences and infinite series. In a sense, these are all of these results are technical. Um, in my opinion, the, uh, the best reason for most people to look at sequences and series is to, is to um, analyze power series. And we kind of we did all the power series stuff first, all the kind of intuitive, useful, here are the applications of the really good applications of sequences and series, and now these are kind of the technical details. Um, still, um, there are a lot of things in, about sequences and series of constants instead of power series that are interesting in and of themselves. And um, a lot of these sections have kind of easy, intuitive parts, and then there are the more theoretical parts. So I'm... Uh, uh, in this section, um, it's theorems on sequences. Uh, about half of what I say is going to seem, hopefully, very clear, very obvious, kind of, oh, haven't we looked at that before? Because we will have looked at a bunch of it before. And then at the end, there's some very technical um, uh, results kind of at the heart of um, the definition of the real numbers. So um, we've had sequences back since differential calculus, I think, first when we defined the exponential function. Um, but since this is a, a section on theorems on sequences, I'm going to define them again carefully. But just intuitively, a sequence is supposed to be just a list of numbers. It just never stops. It's you know something like 1, a half, a third, a fourth, you know, a fifth, it's, they're not added, it's just a list of numbers in order, so, and it just keeps going. So we would usually specify a sequence by saying, oh, the nth term, a sub n, so maybe call this sequence a, a sub n here is just 1 over n. So when n is 1, a sub 1 is 1, a sub 2, so this is a sub 1, this would be a sub 2, a sub 3, a sub 4, um, a sub 5. This is that's all a sequence is supposed to be. Uh, we could start them all at 1. So here you want n greater than or equal to 1. Except it's convenient from time to time to start them at other places. Um, for instance, if you were looking at, oh, I see. <laughs> I see that in the book this was called the sequence B. And what I'm about to write is called the sequence A. Of course, the names don't really matter, but I might as well try to be vaguely consistent with the book. Um, suppose we look at a sequence a sub n that's 1 over n minus 1 times n minus 2. Well, if you're defining a sequence by this formula, so you pick, put in different n's and you look at this number, um, you clearly don't want n to be 1, because then you'd be dividing by 0. That would be undefined. You don't want n to be 2. So maybe you start this sequence when n is 3. and so. You just look at a sub 3, a sub 4, a sub 5, and so on, where a sub 3 then would be 1 over 2 times 1. a sub 4 would be 1 over 3 times, 3 times 2. a sub 5 would be 1 over 4 times 3, and so on. Um, my point is just that, yeah, a sequence is just a list, and we like writing, we give the sequence a name, we like lowercase letters for it, and some indexing variable, it doesn't matter what you call it, the sequence would be the same if I'd written b sub k equals 1 over k, where k is greater than or equal to 1. Um, you don't always want to start at 1, although we could change what n means, and or, you know, how we write the, the sequence, we could re-index it so that our new index starts at 1. But um, it's convenient to be able to start other places. So the actual definition of a sequence, the definition um, first you need to um, let Z sub M, Z is the letter that's usually used, this blackboard bold Z is what's usually used for the integers, so the positive natural numbers, the, ne the negative ones, so 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, keep going, and 0. But I'm going to let this be equal the set of natural numbers greater than or equal to m. So I'm, m is itself, uh, sorry, the set of integers. 
um, greater than or equal to some integer m. Um, and then a sequence, which I would usually just write as something like b sub n, where n is greater than or equal to m, is a function. It's just is a function b that takes you from z sub m into the real numbers. If you want a sequence of real numbers, if you want a sequence of complex numbers, you'd have complex numbers there. You want a sequence of giraffes, you'd have giraffes over there. Um, the sequence being is a function b from there. Um, that's what it, we usually write. So it's just a function. And we usually write b sub n in place of our normal functional notation, in place of b of n. So that's all that a sequence is. Um, and what we're interested in is what happens as n goes to infinity. Do sequences approach, well, one of the things we're interested in is do sequences approach anything as n gets arbitrarily large. Now, if, if n is getting arbitrarily large, then it essentially doesn't matter where you start. You know, if you start at when n is, you know, if you say n is greater than or equal to 1, or you say n is greater than or equal to 37 trillion, if you're going to look at what happens as n goes to infinity, it doesn't really matter where you start. The only, um, the only technical issue is that, well, of course you want your sequence to be defined. But if I left this off, you should just assume that we've chosen n big enough so that this is defined. If what we care about, if all that we care about is the limit as n goes to infinity, which I haven't defined, but I'm about to. So we, um, we've looked at limits of sequences back since differential calculus, and we've had limits of functions with a where the variable could be any real number instead of just having to be an integer. Um, but, and so this definition of limit shouldn't look like anything new to you. Um, we say that a sequence a sub n, where n is greater than or equal to maybe I'll use b, b sub n, where n is greater than or equal to n, converges to L, a real number, um, converges to L if and only if, and right, I should have said, and right. the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n equals L, if and only if if and only if what? Well, the definition of limit. So that thing where you traditionally use uh, the Greek letter epsilon, if and only if, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists But now a natural number uh, sorry, an integer, sorry, exist. An integer. It's true we could we're going to say kind of that it needs to be big enough. So it's true we could assume it's a natural number, but I don't need to write that in. There exists an integer n, capital N, greater than or equal to this initial n value of there exists an integer such that. such that for all n, little n greater than or equal to capital N, the absolute value of b sub n minus L is less than epsilon. All right, this is kind of our standard limit thing. Um, it's as, as something goes to infinity, so you may not remember it so well. But what you want it to say is that 
if someone tells you how close that they want the sequence to come to L, you can tell them how big you have to pick the index to make it happen. And that's what this says. Someone tells you how close they want the sequence to be to L, that means they're specifying an epsilon greater than zero. Um, and then you can tell them that as long as, you can tell them there's this capital N, so that as long as little n is greater than or equal to that capital N, the difference between the, the value of the sequence and L is less than the specified epsilon, which means Bn is within epsilon of L. Great. That's what it means to converge to L. Um, if there is such an L, we say the sequence converges. Otherwise, we say the sequence diverges, where you should be used to the terminology converges and diverges by now. Um, it's important. I'm not going to write it as a theorem. We've looked at this too many times. If a limit exists, it's unique. There aren't two different L's that would satisfy this for a given sequence. Um, so uh, there is, if there's a limit of a sequence, it's the limit. Uh, there aren't two of them to worry about. We do have a slight, it's not even that slight, although it's slight in effect, a slight notational issue. We had the limit as x goes to infinity a long time ago. And, um, and you might wonder, well, suppose b, suppose, let me, let me pick a specific example. Uh, there's one I want. Um, in pi. So let me try to give you an example of a slight problem that you should, you should think about this one time and it should never bother you again, hopefully. So you get this example. Let's look at b sub n equals the sine of n of n pi. Uh, I think that's what I want. Yeah, the sine of n pi. Um, okay, what's the problem here? The question is, what is the limit as n approaches infinity of b sub n? Does, does this sequence converge to some limit l or not? And the answer is the sequence does, but um, and let me tell you the, the other problem after I say why the sequence does n pi, well, sine of, oh, I didn't say where n started. Uh, we care about the limit as n goes to infinity, so it doesn't really matter, but we'll start in it. We'll say n is greater than or equal to zero. Um, the sine of n pi, well, if n is an integer, whether it's greater than or equal to zero or not, uh, the sine of n pi is zero on the nose. This, this sequence is always zero. And certainly the limit as n goes to infinity of zero is zero. It's not much of a surprise. The problem is that if we think of n as being a real variable and write the limit as x goes to infinity of the sine of x pi, well, this does not exist. So this, diverge, this, this function diverges as x goes to infinity. This does not exist. Um, why not? Because it's because, and you may not be used to this yet, but uh, I don't know whether I want to say you should be, but maybe you shouldn't be. I don't know. You need to get used to it pretty fast. There are certain letters we use to kind of denote integer values. They tend to be things like J, K, L, M, N, and there are other variables that we use to denote um, variables that can take on continuous values. So they can be any real number. They don't just hit integer values. And you're just supposed to kind of know from the context, or I've said, consider this sequence. You're supposed to know, ah, n is, has to be an integer. And then this limit means, oh, yeah, as n varies through integers. But this takes some getting used to because you're probably more used to kind of these real continuous variables that could take on any value, even if it's not an integer, like this. I mean, technically, what's the difference between this and having an n there and an n there? Well, either you have to know that n is supposed to denote an integer value and you're taking the limit of a sequence, or somebody has to explicitly tell you. But hopefully, after this, you'll know. This does not exist because if x can just be any real number at all, this just oscillates back and forth between plus and minus 1 as x gets big. It never, 
approaches anything. But at integer values, um, the sequence is always, this function is always zero, so if you're looking at the sequence, it's always zero and its limit exists in zero. All right. Hopefully that'll never bother you again. Um, this kind of thing can happen where the a sequence converges and kind of if you use the same function with a continuous variable, it diverges. You might wonder, can the other way happen? Can, can this converge and this diverge? And there's a theorem, no. And it's kind of obvious why not. So I'm going to just write theorem and I'm going to use what we've now decided is our convention. X is going to be a variable that's allowed to vary through real numbers. And n is going to denote a variable that can only take on integer values if the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is l, then the limit as n approaches infinity of f of n equals l. All this says is if you allow x to be any real number, it's getting arbitrarily big, but not just integers, but arbitrary big real numbers. And as, as x gets arbitrarily big, f of x gets arbitrarily close to l, then it's true that if you only look at the integer values as you get big, then they still have to get closer to l. Well, yeah, because all of them are getting closer to l, so certainly the ones where you hit integer values are getting closer to l. This isn't much of a theorem. It doesn't take any more of a proof than what I just said. But it is important to know <coughs> that if you write one of your usual functions of a kind of a, a variable x where x could take on real number values, and that thing, that function approaches a limit as x approaches infinity, then the sequence you get just by sticking in integer values also approaches the same limit. Um, that's actually, this gets used implicitly quite a bit. Uh, I like this word, deficient. That's a good word. Uh, I guess it's too late to fix it. There, quick. There, fixed. Now I'll erase it. Um, the right definition. Um, so how does this get used? Well, we actually kind of use it often, just without comment. Um, suppose you want to calculate the limit as n goes to infinity of n over e to the n. And here I mean we're looking at the sequence um, b sub n equals n e to the n, and I'll just pick a starting n value for n greater than or equal to 1. <coughs> How do you calculate this limit? I, I've effectively given you no theorems that are specific to calculating limits um, of of sequences. But we know theorems of limits, theorems about limits where you're allowed to have a real variable there. So um, what if you have a real variable there? Well, so to distinguish, we usually call this a discrete variable, one that can only take on integer values. We call this a continuous variable. Um, if x is a continuous variable, how do you do this? Oh, L'Hopital's rule. The numerator approaches infinity, the denominator approaches infinity, and so the limit as x approaches infinity is the derivative of the numerator divided by the derivative of the denominator. It's this limit. Um, and now as x goes to infinity, this is zero. So that theorem says that if the limit when you use a continuous variable exists and equals something, then the limit when you use a discrete variable gives you the same thing. So this limit is zero by L'Hopital's rule. Now, technically, you should, you kind of should write this with like a different variable or some words saying if n is allowed to be any um, real number that's arbitrarily big. But in fact, we're so used to this theorem and it's, in a way, it's so obvious that what most people would write here, and it, it's, it's kind of bad in a way, um, but assuming you know what you're doing, they do L'Hopital's rule with the discrete variable. So they just take 1 or 1 to the n and then say this is 0. Now, 
if this were really a function that could only existed at integer values, you can't take a derivative of it. You, you have to have an interval that gets, you have to have an interval around the place where you want to take a derivative that you can get arbitrarily, so that your variable can get arbitrarily close to certain values. And um, you just can't do that here. But really, you write this knowing that, yeah, I mean that, yeah, if I extend this function to a function with a continuous variable, then I can use low, Patel, low Patel's rule. And the limit I get there would be the same as what you get here. But I'll, I'll say it again. It's a warning that if you look at the function with x's in it and that limit fails to exist, then that doesn't tell you what happens in the, for the sequence. Because just like we looked at a minute ago, it's possible that um, the sequence hits very particular values that do converge, like in our sine of n pi example, and that, and that um, when you put in the continuous variable, things oscillate, well, effectively oscillate so much that no limit is approached. OK. Um, what other theorems do you have about sequences? Well, really, kind of all the, <laughs> I shouldn't say it, but a lot of the theorems that we have about limits involving a continuous variable um, have, corresponding, have corresponding results for these, these discrete variables so that the limits of sequences have a lot of the properties we're used to, including all the arithmetic properties. So the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. The limit of the product is the product of the limits. The limit of the quotient is the quotient of the limits as long as the denominator doesn't approach zero. All these things about arithmetic of sequences that were true um, for limits of functions of a, of a continuous variable are true for sequences. So um, I won't write that as a theorem. It's certainly in the book, but just as an example, and I suppose I'll make it be exactly an example that's in the book. Um, you know, one example is we know the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n is 0. There are several ways you should know this. I'd like to say, first of all, it's just blatantly obvious. As n gets really big, 1 over n approaches 0. But we know this for a continuous variable, for instance. And that means that since the limit is x approaches infinity, 1 over x is 0. This is certainly true. But then, so what's the limit as n approaches infinity of the sequence? 5 minus 7 over n squared times 3 plus 4 over n cubed. Well, it's not like this is a big deal. I mean, you, even if I didn't tell you it was a theorem, um, even if I didn't tell you it was a theorem, you would probably write the correct thing. It's just that, OK, yeah, what would you do if these were all x's, for that matter? Um, it's OK. We know that since this limit is 0, if you take the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over n squared, you get 0 squared. Well, that's 0. And 7 times that. So 7 over n squared would be 7 times 0. So this part converges to 0. And yeah, you've got all these differences and products and sums. It just doesn't matter. You do what you think you do. You do the arithmetic with the limit, even though it's over a discrete variable. This part goes to 0, this part goes to 0, you end up with 5 times 3, you get 15. Yippee. <laughs> the point is not that this isn't important. It's that it's um, considering all the work we've done with limits in the past, hopefully it seems kind of obvious and it seems like I'm not saying much. Um, all right. What else is true for limits of sequences? Well. It shouldn't be a surprise. There's a pinching theorem. So a pinching theorem, like there was for real limits. A pinching theorem. For sequences. And you may not remember what the pinching theorem said, but you know the name is kind of suggested. Something gets pinched. Let's suppose you've got three sequences. I'll just write a sub n 
b sub n and c sub n, and suppose it's always true, you know, for n greater than or equal to m, suppose that, you know, the b sub n sequence is always between the a sub n and the c sub n sequence, and suppose this one and this one converge to the same thing. So they both converged to L. Then the limit as n goes to infinity of B sub n is also L. It gets pinched. It's if this is always in between this one and this one, and this one goes to L, and this one goes to L, this has no place else to go. It, its limit has to be L. Um, you use this, essentially how you use the pinching theorem for functions of a continuous variable. It's not a, not a big deal. Um, typical examples, we love examples with like minus 1 to the n and sine and cosine. So the limit as n goes to infinity of something like n cubed over sine of n squared or something. Sine of n squared. Well, sine of n quantity squared. Sine is always between minus 1 and 1. So if you square it, this is always between 0 and 1. So if we want to calculate this limit, use this as always, that numerator is always greater than or equal to 0. And it's always less than or equal to 1. So um, now I'll assume that n is greater than or equal to 1. We don't want to pass through zero, we wouldn't be able to divide. So you assume that as n goes to infinity, zero sits there happily being zero. One over n cubed as n goes to infinity, well, that goes to zero as n approaches infinity. Um, you get one over something bigger and bigger, so as you approach infinity, this approaches zero. So this gets pinched, or some people would say squeezed. And what that tells you is the limit as n approaches infinity of this part is zero, so I'll just write an arrow. That part also approaches zero. Okay, great. Um, what else should you know about sequences? Well, the, I'm going to say one more basic thing and then we're going to get theoretical. It's how can you produce interesting sequences? Well, <clears throat> let me give you the example or an example and then give you the result. Hopefully this will seem pretty obvious, although sometimes things that seem obvious are false, so you have to be a little careful. The limit as n approaches infinity of, yeah, of, one over n, of cosine of 1 over n. Well, as n goes to infinity, 1 over n approaches 0. Um, so you would suspect this is approaching the cosine of 0, which is 1. True, it's true. <laughs> um, and what are we using? Just, it's really a theorem. If um, the limit as n approaches infinity of some sequence is L, so the sequence converges to L, and F. And f is a function which is continuous at L. And I have to say more than this. Um, um, and whose domain includes all of the a sub n for n greater than or equal to some n, then, then the new sequence f of a n 
converges to f of L. That's what we just used, really. It's cosine is a continuous function. So you should think, ah, yes, that means as whatever you're taking cosine of approaches something, cosine approaches it, the value at the limit of the inside thing. And that's what we just used, that if you have a sequence, you can form a new sequence by applying this continuous function to f of a n, provided that's, there's this part in the parentheses, provided this is defined, which means that the a n's need to be in the domain of f at least for little n sufficiently big. Um, and then this new sequ sequence would converge to f of l, assuming f is continuous at this limit. Um, but, you know, again, a lot of theorems about sequences should just be kind of, or applications of them, examples of how you use these theorems, should be kind of clear to you at this point. Yeah, of course this is 1. As n approaches infinity, this approach is 0, and the cosine of 0 is 1. Yes, if cosine were not continuous, that would not be true. But we know it's continuous, and we're kind of used to dealing with it, and um, hopefully that doesn't surprise you. All right. The bad news is that now I need to talk about, so my point up to here is that, yeah, sequences aren't bad. They're just lists of numbers, and yeah, now we have the limit as n goes to infinity, and in the past we've had x goes to infinity, or actually we've looked at a few sequences. Um, but now there are some um, kind of results at, the, at the, kind of the heart of mathematics and the heart of the construction of the real numbers that I need to talk about. This is a little theoretical. Um, a lot of people would not do this in a class, but I'm going to talk about it. So, um, suppose E is a set of real numbers. So, not all of them, not the set of real numbers, a set of real numbers. So, that means, another way of saying that is E is a subset of the real numbers, and in notation it's E, this is a subset or equal, so subset is a subset of the real numbers. Um, then the definition, let me try to write definition correctly this time. Definition, well, we want to say E is bounded above if, so, um, M is a real number M. is an upper bound if and only if for all x in E, x is less than or equal to n. Great. <laughs> An upper bound. Hopefully, this is what you thought it meant. Uh, we may have defined this before. An upper bound, it's just something that's greater than or equal to everything that's in E. That's an upper bound of E. Um, we're not saying it's, it's um, the smallest one or the maximum value of E. We're saying it's at least something that's greater than or equal to everything in E. It could be wildly greater. Like the biggest thing in E could be 1, and N could be f M could be 15 trillion. So it's just an upper bound. Um, if such an M exists, we say E is bounded above. So this is an upper bound. The E is bounded above. All right, um, but there is the notion of a least upper bound. A least upper bound, 
would be the smallest number that's an upper bound. So that anything smaller than that would not be an upper bound. So, um, and, well, anyway, I'll come to that in a minute. But you could ask for a least upper bound. Um, but let me come to that in a minute. Uh, not surprisingly, you can define a lower bound. Uh, a real number m is a lower bound. Is a lower bound of e if and only if for all x and e, you ought to be able to guess this. Uh, m is less than or equal to x, so it's it's smaller or less than or equal to. If such an m exists, we say that e is bounded below. And the set E is bounded means it's bounded above and below. So there's something. You might go, well, isn't everything bounded above and below? No. If the set has arbitrarily big things in it or arbitrarily small things in it, um, then it's not bounded above or below. For instance, if M is the set of all real numbers, it's not bounded above. There's no, there's no real number that's greater than or equal to all real numbers. Um, e is bounded. If and only if if and only if e is bounded above and below. So it doesn't go out infinitely far in either direction, down towards negative infinity or up towards positive infinity. All right. That's what upper bounds and lower bounds are. I wanted to find one more thing before I state kind of a, in a big theorem about the real numbers. So I need to define, it, it's not clear that those have anything to, it shouldn't be clear to you that those have anything to do with sequences. And I'm going to explain some results for sequences in a minute. But um, I want another definition. Definition a sequence a sub n, where n is greater than or equal to some starting value, is a Cauchy sequence. If and only if, let me say what I'm, the point of what I'm about to say. I'm about to say something involving epsilons and their exist in and all that. It'll look a lot like the definition of limit or have some aspects of the definition of limit in it, except there's no limit in it. We're just going to kind of refer internally to the sequence of A's and talk about the distance between things in the sequence getting closer, you know, getting smaller and smaller, so that the terms in the sequence are getting closer and closer together. The whole point of a Cauchy sequence is that you define a condition that looks like it's convergence, that looks like it's talking about whether the sequence converges to some limit or not, without ever referring to the limit. Right? In the normal definition of a, of a sequence converging to L, you, you, of course, use L. You say that the distance between the sequence and L gets arbitrarily small. Now we want to say the theorem is going to be, in fact, that if internally the elements of the sequence get arbitrarily close together, then, in fact, the sequence has to converge to some limit, even though that limit L is not appearing in the definition. So that's what a Cauchy sequence is going to be, a sequence is a Cauchy sequence if and only if, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists m, uh, I'll call it n, some capital N greater than or equal to this little m, such that, so some integer, such that for all little n and little m, uh, I can't use that, um, for all n and k greater than or equal to capital N, the absolute value of a n minus a k 
is less than epsilon. Right? This doesn't refer to a limit at all. You know, there's no L in this. This is, we just want that you tell me how close, how close you want elements of the sequence to be, and I can give you a, a capital N, so a starting index, so that no matter what M and N, uh, N and K you pick, greater than or equal to that capital N, the absolute value of this difference is that small. So you could fix one of them and let the other one get arbitrarily large, and this still has to stay small. This is a Cauchy sequence, and it is not hard to show. Um, I'm not going to, to do it, but it's not particularly hard to show. Well, maybe I'll give you the heart of the argument. If you take a n minus a k, you can use mathematician's stupid trick Number one, add zero in a clever way. I will subtract an L and add an L. Um, why, so I've subtracted an L, I've added an L. This is still the absolute value of a n minus a k. And then there's the triangle inequality, which says this absolute value is less than or equal to this one. And why am I writing this? Because if a sequence converges to L, then you can make this arbitrarily small by picking N big, and this arbitrarily small by picking K big, and so you can make these arbitrarily small, and these are, this is, this is less than or equal to this sum, and greater than or equal to zero, so you can make this arbitrarily close to zero by picking N and K big. So, well, that's what this says. So that um, if a sequence converges to L, then the sequence had to be a Cauchy sequence. There's no way for the terms, you know, there's no way for the terms to all converge, the terms of the sequence to all converge to L without the terms of the sequence getting arbitrarily close to each other when you're far out in the sequence. The surprising thing, or the, that's not surprising, the, um, one of the defining properties of the real numbers is that the converse is true. Cauchy sequences always converge. So, um, so we've defined, I've defined um, a lower bound, I've defined an upper bound. Um, certainly you could talk about a smallest or a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound. It's not clear that they exist, but it is part, you, to define the real numbers, there are several ways to do it, and uh, I'm kind of lumping three of them together. So this is the least, this, this is a theorem. Um, and it's the least upper bound property of the reals, least upper bound property. and completeness of the reals. And it goes like this. Every non-empty set E which is bounded above set of real numbers. So uh, when I talk about the set E, it's a set of real numbers. Every non-empty set E, which is bounded above, has a least upper bound. So there is something that's the smallest upper bound if there's an upper bound. Or kind of by negating this statement and looking at the negatives of everything, it's easy to see that what I'm about to write is equivalent to that. Every non-empty set of real numbers, which is bounded below, 
which is bounded below, has a greatest lower bound. So either one of these would typically be called the least upper bound property of the real numbers. But, you know, it really we kind of look at this one the most, but this one, these two are clearly equivalent. We just kind of picked that we prefer to talk about the least upper bound and the greatest lower bound when we're stating this property generally. And three, the completeness of the real numbers. A sequence of real numbers converges. converges if and only if it's a Cauchy sequence. So wh what I just said with the triangle inequality is that if a sequence converges, it has to be a Cauchy sequence. The, the content here is that if it's a Cauchy sequence, it has to converge. This means, it, really, you can define the real numbers with this property. You take um, Cauchy sequences of, of rational numbers. But what this means is that um, you you have the ability to tell if a sequence of real numbers converges without knowing what it converges to because you can prove it's a Cauchy sequence that any two terms in the sequence get arbitrarily close together if you go out far enough in the sequence and that'll tell you it's a Cauchy sequence and then the theorem, this theorem tells you that the sequence has to converge but it doesn't in any way tell you what it converges to which is a little uh, disturbing or cool depending on your point of view. Um, okay, what does this have to do with anything? I told you this was theoretical. So, what do we want to do with this? One of the ways that you tell, you can tell that a sequence converges is, so now I'm going to draw a number line, so here's, the x-axis. And let's suppose we have an increasing sequence. So an is increasing. So it's like an increasing function. It, it means that when the index gets bigger, the function gets bigger. When the index is greater than or equal to this means if um, k is greater than or equal to n, then ak is greater than or equal to a n. So as your index gets bigger, you, you don't get any smaller. So suppose you've got an increasing sequence. You can kind of picture it as starting like, you know, maybe here's a1, and your sequence is just going over here. So as, as the index goes up, your sequence moves to the right, because as your index gets bigger, you're getting, well, at least as big. Right, so you picture this. Well, there are, there are only two choices. There's either there's something out here that's bigger than all of these, or there's not. And if there's never some place that all of these are less than or equal to, well, then it gets bigger than anything, and then it diverges to infinity. So if the sequence is increasing and it's not bounded above, then the sequence diverges to infinity because it's increasing. And it's not bounded above, so it gets bigger than anything you name. Well, that's what it means to diverge to infinity. And well, and once it gets bigger than that, it keeps increasing, so it just keeps getting bigger than anything you name. Okay, so it diverges to infinity if it's not bounded above. If it is bounded above, <clears throat> then there's a least upper bound by the least upper bound property of the real numbers. The sequence is bounded above there's a least upper bound. So the smallest thing that's greater than or equal to everything in here. Well, not surprisingly, that means that the sequence has to bunch up right there. And that least upper bound is the limit. So the least upper bound property 
tells us that increasing sequences, which are bounded above, so uh, suppose a n n is greater than n is an increasing sequence. Then a n converges if and only if it's bounded. The set in a n converges if and only if we say the sequence is bounded above, but I was talking about sets of real numbers before, so I mean the set containing all the elements of the sequence. Then a n converges if and only if it's bounded above. And if it diverges, it diverges to positive infinity. It just mean if it diverges, it does so because it gets arbitrarily large. Because there are only two choices. Either the sequence is bounded above or it's not. Okay, great. Well, this is another way that you can tell that a sequence, or a way, aside from being a Cauchy sequence, where you can tell that a sequence has to converge without being able to decide what it converges to, and it follows from the least upper bound property, the reals. It's at the heart of it. It's suppose you show a sequence is increasing, um, and you can find something that's greater than or equal to um, everything in the sequence. So a real number that's, then the sequence has to converge. In no way does that tell you what it converges to. It's just a theoretical result that it converges. Um, not surprisingly, you have the same result, an analogous result with decreasing. If the a, a is decreasing means if you take something bigger, you get smaller or less than or equal to. So this, <clears throat> you would picture this going the other way. So you would have a1, then a2 is smaller, a or less than or equal to. And you keep going down, and it's the same kind of thing. Either, either there's a lower bound here, or there's not. And if there's no lower bound, then the sequence is getting arbitrarily negative and will diverge to negative infinity. But if there is a lower bound, well, there's a greatest lower bound. And not surprisingly, the sequence has to converge to that because it just bunches up right there, and that will be the limit. So suppose a n is a decreasing sequence. Then a n converges if and only if it's bounded below. And if it diverges, it diverges to minus infinity. Both of these should seem obvious. You know, if you kind of picture the number line and the, and the sequence bunching up, if it's bounded above or below. Um, the term that includes both, we say a n is monotonic if it's either decreasing or increasing. And you know if you've got a monotonic sequence, so it's either increasing or decreasing, that's bounded, a bounded monotonic sequence, it has to converge. Um, OK. So <laughs> I, I've said these theorems. Um, how do you use these to show that anything converges? All right, this is, a, I'm going to give an example. It's going to kind of look ahead to what we want to do with sums and partial sums, but I want to use, okay, I want to use the following sequences. So it may not be clear, but this gives us a way of comparing what two sequences do. So let me look at, uh, if I want to match the notation in the book, I want a sub n. So <clears throat> this is an example. It's also going to lead us to another theorem that's closely related to what we just said. I may not state it as a theorem because 
sometimes that just obscures what's really going on. If it's prose, you look at this weird sequence and this sequence. Both of these, where n is greater than or equal to zero. All right. So these sequences are defined as summations. Um, this is something we're headed towards in the next section. But <clears throat> you know, it's a perfectly reasonable sequence. You give me a number like 1. What is a sub 1? Well, it's the sum as k goes from 0 to 1 of 1 over 2 to k plus 1. So, while these are kind of specified in a vaguely unusual way, that seems so unusual after next section, they're perfectly good sequences. Um, what's the big deal? Well, they're both increasing sequences. So both of these are increasing. Why? Because as n goes up, you just add more positive terms. So a n, the next as n gets bigger, you add more positive stuff, well, then you get bigger. Same thing here. You're adding more positive terms as n gets bigger. So um, both of these are increasing sequences. In fact, we've looked at this. This is the partial sums of a geometric sequence, uh, of a geometric series, sorry. Uh, when k is 0, we start at 1. This, the partial sums here go 1, a half. 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 2 cubed plus 1 over 2 to the fourth, and so on. And we've actually looked at this, this sequence and this infinite sum, so this limit of partial sums that you write with the dot, dot, dot. We, we did this in an earlier section, that the limit of this as n approaches infinity, so <clears throat> of these partial sums, is 2. Uh, all of this stuff adds up to 1. Um, so, in fact, we talked about this when we were talking about bread in a restaurant, dividing it into two pieces over and over again. Um, with this limit, or no, I think we did it in another context. Anyway, um, we know that this converges, and what it converges to is 2. How on earth does that tell us anything about this one? Um, well, the answer is that because these denominators are bigger than these denominators, um, this fraction is smaller than this fraction. So the terms, the, the things you're adding up here are less than, or strictly less than the things here. I'm going to write less than or equal to because that's all that's relevant. But in fact, we know it's strictly less than. We have this inequality holding for all n, that a n is less than or equal to b n. In fact, we'd only, we only care that it's true for all n sufficiently big. So what? Well, the a n's are increasing. Right? So the a n's converge if and only if they're bounded above. And I didn't say it a minute ago, but if they're bounded above, then, then they converge. And what they converge to is less than or equal to any upper bound that you pick. OK. Well, but the a n's are less than the b n's. Certainly, if the b n's are bounded above, then the a n's are bounded above. But the b n's are converging to 2. And the b n's are also an increasing sequence. So the b n's converge to 2. And the b n's are an increasing sequence. That means the b n's are bounded above, and the least upper bound of the b n's is 2. So, in particular, the bn's are bounded above. So the an's have to be bounded above. And an upper bound of the an's is 2. 2 is an upper bound of the bn's. It's, in fact, the least upper bound of the bn's. So we know that an, the sequence an is bounded above, and it's bounded above by 2. So what does that tell us? This is an increasing sequence, and it is bounded above by 2. Well, then it converges, because it's increasing and bounded above. And what it converges to has to be less than any upper bound, like 2. So what we conclude from this, because we know that both of these are increasing sequences, um, 
and that this one is bounded above, it converges and, well, sorry, what we get from this, these are both increasing sequences. We know that this converges to two because we can actually calculate the limit. That means that this one is bounded above by two, and so it converges to something less than or equal to two. So what we conclude from this is that the ANs converge, the limit of the ANs exists, and that this L is less than or equal to two. But we don't know what it is. Aside from that, we can't conclude anything else about it just from this argument. But this does tell us it converges and that what it converges to is less than or equal to two. This is kind of a, a fundamental example of it, down the road when we're looking at infinite series, so infinite summations, these limits of partial sums, how we're going to be able to tell <coughs> that that limit exists without being able to say what it is. We're just going to know it converges to something without being able to say what the something is. I want to say one more thing, and that'll be the end. It's suppose, suppose, forget this example, but suppose we have two increasing sequences, a n and b n, and we know the a n's are less than or equal to the b n's. What we just showed is if this sequence converges, if the bigger one converges, then so does the smaller one. <coughs> Um, if the bigger one diverged, that would tell you nothing. If this one went to infinity, all you would kind of know is that the ANs in the limit are less than or equal to infinity. Well, that doesn't tell you what they do. I mean, either they, they could go to infinity or they could go to 37. 37 is less than or equal to infinity. So the bigger one going to infinity doesn't tell you anything. But the smaller one going to infinity would tell you the bigger one has to, because if this one gets unboundedly large, then this one has to get unboundedly large. So in, in that direction, you can conclude something. So if you've got two sequences like this, and they're both increasing, and the upper one converges, the bigger one converges, then the smaller one has to converge. And if the smaller one diverges, then the bigger one has to diverge and that they both diverge to positive infinity. You shouldn't have to memorize that, really. It should just seem reasonable that if, if this converges to L, and this is less than or equal to that, and this is getting bigger and bigger because it's an increasing sequence, then this converges to something because it's bounded above, and what it converges to has to be less than or equal to L. And if this gets unboundedly large, then of course this thing that's bigger than that has to get unboundedly large. All right, <clears throat> this is a good lead-in to what we're going to look at, some of the things we're going to look at in the next section, where we look at kind of limits of sums like this. And what we want to know is whether they converge or not. And this is kind of fundamental, this, this bit about increasing sequences or decreasing sequences. So monotonic sequences is going to be very important to us in the next section. <laughs>